flying there, I because I was in a different group than most of the other missionaries that were going to Puebla, we uh, I met them like the day before when we were all in the visa office when the was the consulate in Salt Lake City getting ready for our visas, and the next day they uh, we we met in, we met in the early in the morning to fly because they the flight plans are always you fly from Salt Lake City at, to Houston Texas and then from Houston you fly into Puebla because it's one of only two airports in the U.S. that connect to Puebla. So we waited there for a couple hours and got to Puebla that night. And then my first couple of days, I arrived in Mexico the first the first week of December. And about a week and a half into my mission, being my, my time in the mission field, I should say, was one of the big holidays in Mexico when they celebrate the the day of their patron saint, which is the Virgin Guadalupe. And so my first few days it were, were the start of the celebration because they start celebrating... That day, the, the day is on the 12th of December, and they start celebrating it on like this, like for a week before. And so when I first got there, my trainer was from Panama. He, I spoke more Spanish than he did English, so there was tough time communicating. And so I had no idea what was going on. There were fireworks going off. There were celebrations in the street. And so for my first week, it was tough getting work done, especially at night because of all the the different parties and the festivities that were going on. And I learned very quickly. One of the, one of the things I learned quickly was like, don't like you, you not to like say things or like act surprised because people will look at you like people expect that if you're there, you kind of at least have a general idea of what's going on. And so my lack of knowledge about these things and tr I couldn't ask my companion about them in public. And so it was, a little difficult in that sense my first couple weeks, but after that I got in the swing of things. Probably during the holidays was a was a great time. A lot of different fun like holiday traditions they have going on, and people will enjoy because it it's a it's a cooler climate, and so people it felt a little a little more Christmassy I would imagine than other parts of Mexico, and that made things kind of nice as well for my first yeah the first month or two in the in the mission field. At that time, the Mexico Puebla mission was, like I've mentioned before, it's most of the area between the Mexico City area and the state of Veracruz, and so it had most of the state, most of the Mexican state of Puebla, as well as the state of Tlaxcala. And Tlaxcala is a word from the Aztec language. I think it means something about like tortillas or like places where they make tortillas. And there's a lot of places, like most of the places in the in the Puebla mission, both I guess now both of the Puebla missions have a mixture of Spanish names and Aztec names, and that made it really interesting because writing emails home, I would I like I would have a hard time first of all learning how to pronounce the places, and then my parents would they wouldn't be able to tell anyone where I was at because they wouldn't know how to pronounce it. But there. But they'd have places like one of my areas was was the town was San Gabriel Ometoxla, and how it got the name was the the people that had gone through there they had arrived in this town on the day of San Gabriel every I guess every Catholic saint has like a certain day, so they arrived there on the day of San Gabriel, and then they looked around and they saw that there were two rabbits I think it was or at least this is the legend at least two rabbits near where they founded the town and the word the way you say two rabbits in Aztec is Ometoxla and so the town name is now San Gabriel Ometoxla and that's how pretty much all the towns are there except for Puebla itself I don't really know what Puebla means but so yeah the the mission is the state the state of Puebla and Tlaxcala it's the like when the Spanish conquered Mexico. They went through the mission like they had help from people, from the people, the people of Tlaxcala to help them conquer the Aztecs. Like there's his like part of my mission has like the supposed road that they took when they crossed the mountains to go over into Mexico City. Another cool thing that happened there happened in my first area actually was all the events that happened on Cinco de Mayo. Cinco de Mayo was it was in Puebla, and so they have 
these these forts on a hill in the middle of the city and they're as far as I know they're, they're still the same forts from the time of the battle and so you go there and it's a huge it's a huge thing when Cinco de Mayo comes around in Puebla unless there's something really wrong going on in the city at that time it's like the the city and the state fair and all these different things going on at once people people have a have a good time just going and seeing these different um all the different things that Puebla has to offer all the merchants coming in with stuff that they that they can make and sell it in different parts of the state they don't celebrate it anywhere else either like Cinco de Mayo is pretty much just a holiday they celebrate in Puebla and then it's an excuse I guess here for everyone to go ahead and get drunk and party in the US but in Puebla it's their that's their thing there's a differences between what we in the US think of as Mexican food and what they eat in Mexico that you something that you hear about all the time but for example if you go in if you go to Mexico and you ask for an enchilada you aren't going to be getting this big old fatty tortilla filled with all sorts of things with huge amounts of salsa on top it's probably going to be a smaller tortilla with maybe a little bit of like i don't know like ripped up pieces of chicken in there long and thin with some sauce with some sauce on top but it's not it's not the big thing we have here in the United States another thing that they have in Puebla specifically is this sauce that's called mole and it's they pretty much just have, they have they have this stuff called mole poblano which is poblano is how you say it's from Puebla and it's like a it's like a chocolate salsa kind of thing and so they and it's this weird mix you're like it it's it, it tastes good it's an, it's an, kind of an acquired taste though because it's like you've got the sweetness from kind of the sweetness of the chocolate combined with the spiciness of it being a salsa and i think the story goes that it was made some one time back 4 or 500 years ago that the someone like some big person like a i don't know a catholic bishop or something was traveling through the area and they want and made a surprise visit to Puebla and so they didn't have any actual like really big meals they could make so they just kind of emptied out their pantries and kind of mashed it all together mixed it all up and that was mole they had some chocolate and some peppers and chilies and different things and it came out and so it was it's pretty good i guess that it's kind of an acquired taste but you'll find it sometimes and you'll find it poured on top of burritos you'll just find it poured on top of just plain chicken you'll just eat it with tortillas um you'll find it in tamales that's how i got used to it was eating it in tamales and then when i had it in larger quantities it wasn't it i i was already kind of used to it so it didn't ha it didn't really make me all that sick and it didn't it was pretty good um another thing kind of switching topics a little bit to the history is you can go to there's this one town in Puebla and it's called Cholula and it's kind of a suburb of Puebla I think and this town has pyramids and they're they're not they're not like these hugely known pyramids like the kind like like the ones you hear about like in Mexico City and different things but they're supposedly some of the largest pyramids in the world and so it was fun for us cuz we'd go to the we we'd go to this place Cholula and the the zone leaders actually lived about a 5 minute walk at most from these pyramids their house was like right by the base of them and so every time we'd get together and meet at the zone leaders house in Cholula we'd eventually go over and walk around the pyramids there was a soccer field right by so we'd always end up playing soccer in the in the shadows of this pyramid and there's some cool stuff they're like there's this place where like you can be standing in like the middle of this pyramid complex where there they'll be like in the middle of a courtyard with a pyramid behind them and parts of it also coming out around them and if they stand right in this exact spot you can clap there and about 100 feet away outside of the of the pyramid box you can hear the clapping loud and clear as if you were standing like 5 feet away and so that was pretty cool 
the church is pretty strong in Puebla. Um, there's a couple of towns that have had missionaries there for, or like church members there for a couple of generations, which is really, really weird for Mexico. And so they had like, there's this town called Neotican, and Neotican has a stake. And it's a fair, it's fairly average for like a decent sized Mexican town, but the town has, when I was there, nine, eight or nine wards. They split it into two stakes right after I left. And it was like one of the first places where the church and missionaries had success while they were, after they arrived in Mexico. It was right by the mountain. It was right by the the foot of some of these like volcanic mountains that were, that divided Puebla from Mexico City. And so they just came down from the mountains. Some went to Mexico City, some went to Puebla and they had success. There's an old chapel in the area. Another area that has a lot of members is the town of San Gabriel Matoxla that has smaller than Nail Tikan, but it has three wards split up between like within the town. So it's the church work there has been fairly successful today. There's nine, nine or 10 stakes, I think lots of wards since they split the mission, since, since they split it into Puebla North and South, every, like, well, the, the, the number of missionaries in the area has doubled. So it's been, it's a good time. They're having a lot of, a lot of good success. There are a lot of people getting baptized and being able to, to find the gospel in their lives. The Aztecs were, like, they had a lot of power in the Puebla area back, you know, 500 years ago. And so today you find a lot of people in Puebla that are still, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that they're like always boasting about the fact that they're descended from the Aztecs, but you can tell, like you go onto buses and the buses a lot of times are covered, like they're, the insides have a lot of stakers. So you can tell like the person's point of view, you'll see, you'll see everything from like, Sometimes they'll have their prayer beads or like the the prayer like the the prayer of the uh, bus driver, different things, saying like you know, please keep us safe and help me to to drive this carefully and not get any accidents. But then you'll also see like a lot of times you'll see a poster that says like orgullosamente Azteca, which is proudly Aztec with like this picture of this massive like really ripped Mexican guy with a with an Aztec headdress on. And so you can see they're all, they're still pretty, pretty proud of the fact that they're descended from the Aztecs. And a lot of people today in the area, they'll still learn Aztec words. It's not, it's pretty much a dead language. Like most people that speak, that speak Nahuatl, the Aztec language also learn how to speak Spanish. But you'll find in some of the more remote towns, you'll find that parents still teach their children how to speak the language or you'll find bilingual schools where they will learn Spanish as well as Nahuatl. And that made for an interesting time because a lot of times when in those areas, if a person didn't want to speak to the missionaries, then they would just start speaking to Nahuatl. And it was a easy sign for us to know they have, they don't want to listen. So just walk away. But I learned it. But I had a companion who had talked with one of the members who spoke both languages and had given had given us a couple of, like, a few small things. I can't think, remember any of the words off the top of my head, but they were just some basic things. The language is difficult, so it would be, being able to string together a sentence probably takes, would take more knowledge of the language than I would know, but they, she taught us basic words like how to say, I think the word for Jesus Christ was toteoschi or something like that. Um, Tiang, I think, like, Tiange, I think, was how you say church. And you used to find a lot of Aztec words being used around the area, like a lot of fruits and vegetables in Mexico. If they are like native to the area or native to Mexico, you'll find that they still use their the the, the Nahuatl word, like the word like turkey, for example. In Spanish, turkey would be pavo. But when you're in it, but in a lot of people in, in Puebla will still call it by its not by the its Nahuatl name, which is Wajolote. And so 
it took me close to a year probably to finally realize that that wajolote was the word that they would use and so i would have to get used to hearing them talking about how they were going to have wajolotes and there was also fruits and vegetables i can't think of any right now as well because they were there were words that I would hear once or twice and then never again because I don't routinely ask for for those for, for some of those fruits and vegetables. But there's even other words like I've been taking a class this semester where we learned about Spanish words that come from the Aztec language and they're like words like chocolate and tomato come from the come from the Nahuatl language and so this still has a fairly strong effect around the world because. We, we use those words on a daily basis. So Puebla itself, most like the only missionaries in the mission that got cars were like the assist, like the assistants, the secretaries, and so most of the rest of us, when we had to get around, sometimes we could get rides from members, but we mainly got around through public transportation, which was with buses. And the buses in Mexico can be a little crazy. Like, they have a lot of buses that follow similar routes, and so you can stand on a corner and have five buses go by, and and none of them will be the bus you're looking for. And when it does come by, they don't really have scheduled stops. Like, they don't... Some, like, here in the States, where, like, every quarter mile, they have, like, a nice little bus stop with, the, the cover, with like, the, the little cover over the bench. No, it's just you stand on the corner, and you hold out your hand and signal for the bus, and hopefully you signal the right one, and... You, you catch the eye of the correct driver. Driving is kind of crazy as well. There were, I had one area where we lived a block away from one of the main streets in the city that went from like the main bus station where we would have transfers and it just went around straight to downtown. And so the traffic there was, was pretty bad. The, we would go there and... Yeah, they, they they would just take us around on buses. They would drive kind of fast and like well, really fast. Speed bumps were always a, always a fun time. Um, the weather is pretty nice. It actually kind of reminds me of Provo, except without the snow, which I love because I'm from Arizona and I'm not a huge fan of the snow. But we would uh, like I would use a sweater every now and then. But we were mainly fine with just our just a regular white shirt and tie and that was that made it really nice the city is surrounded by a couple of mountains and so you have to the north kind of like yeah about to the north is this mountain called la malinche and malinche is along the border between the states of puebla and tlaxcala so it's right in the middle of the mission and they allow missionaries to go up that mountain sometimes if you're in the right zone then you can get permission to spend a, a p part of a p-day going up the being able to go up the mountain as a zone and it's pretty cool you can get a cool view of a lot of the mission and then to the west between mexico city and puebla is are these mountains called one of them is popocatepetl which is an aztec word meaning like the mountain that smokes and it's a, and it's a volcano hasn't really had any problems for a while it's don't worry about that. It's probably not going to blow up on you, but it's it's pretty cool, and it has it's just like your regular mountain. It just goes like that, like a regular mountain peak, and then there's like there's always snow to work at the top of it, and sometimes you can see a little bit of the smoke coming up from the volcano. And that right next to it is another one called Ista Xiwatl. Some people just call it Ista for short because it's a confusing name, and it they also refer to it as the sleeping woman or la mujer dormida because it looks like it's the, the profile of a woman lying down kind of like Timpanogos here in, in Provo and so those mountains they're like you can see those from pretty much anywhere in the city sometimes if you're if you're in the right light then way off in the distance you can see a mountain between Mexico between Puebla and Veracruz and it's the highest point in Mexico and it's called Pico de Orizaba or just Pico, and it's also really like it's really high, but it it's nice. Puebla's nice because you can actually see these things. It's not like Mexico City, a couple hours away, where it's filled with smoke and grime and different things all the time. And so the 
skies are fairly clear. There's a there's an like there, there's an observatory kind of thing in, in the middle of the city, and so you're able to have decent skies. It's not it's not at all like it's it's not like Mexico City, even though a lot of people say that they're really similar. Me Puebla is a lot nicer place to live. It's fairly clean. There's like a a river that runs through part of the city. It's kind of a dirty river, but it's a good. But Puebla itself is really cool. There's the downtown area has a lot of fun places you can visit. Has the Zocalo, which is like a it's like the main square in the middle of the town. And while you're there, you can see like the the state cathedral. They have fast food places around there. You can go to a McDonald's or different places like that if you want American food. Or you can find other like more authentic Mexican places. Um, as I said before, there's always the, the Cinco de Mayo forts and they have a lot of different... Along with the forts themselves, I think there's like a, a museum. There's um, a giant monument you can see from the road. And from that, from the hill, you can see around all around the city. Puebla also has a, like a professional soccer team, and I think they might also have like a I think they have a baseball team as well. You'll never hear about the baseball team. It's mainly just a soccer team, and even then, they're a bit of a joke in the Mexican soccer league. But everyone always talk. A lot of times in Puebla, you'll see people go like go like this. It's kind of and they were. They would. It's. They say this phrase that means like. They say "pon la de pueblo," which is like do the, put on the pueblo thing because the soccer jersey has a stripe right down the side, and it means just kind of like you know gonna share it. Like when they go like that, it just means like you know share it with me or like help me out here with something. And so it's kind of a cool thing that comes from the from the soccer team with that. Uh, and that's. It's about it. From Puebla as well, the, the bus stop in the main city, you can, people can get around. There's, a, there's an airport outside of town, which is how the mission, the American missionaries got in and out. We would, we would, uh, like when we left, we drove from where we were staying and went to this airport and then flew to Houston, Texas. And from there, we all went to our separate homes. The missionaries that are native speaking or that are from, I guess I should say that are from Mexico or other parts of Latin America will instead go to Mexico City, but in my from my experience, when I was there, they didn't want the Americans going to Mexico City if they didn't have to because it's Mexico City, and so they just had us fly out of Puebla instead and take a little bit more time and but safer time of of going home. Puebla is kind of a is a safer place than Mexico City. I think I might have mentioned that before that it has kind of a better reputation in terms of safety and the people that are that are there. Like I remember in one of my areas, I had a companion who was from Chihuahua, which is along the border of, between Mexico and the United States. And in Chihuahua, you hear, that's where you hear all the stuff happening with the drug lords and Juarez and all these different things. And so he's used to hearing, you know, every day about like big news event, like about things like, oh, like the drug cartels came through and killed some people. But when he and I were together, it was a big news story in Puebla when they found a drug lord in the in the city. Like they found, like they discovered that there was a drug lord in Puebla, and it was front page news. People were talking about it for a week, and so that kind of gives an idea of at least you know four years ago, whatever it was, the fact that Puebla was a fairly safe place, and it's. It's pretty good in that sense and that you don't hear about the drug lords. It's far enough south in the in the country that you're far away from from the drug wars, but you're also removed from other difficult from, from other difficulties. And so Puebla has might have some of its problems, but its problems aren't of the big dangerous drug drug lord kinds of kinds of problems. And that made that made it like it helped it helped me and like my parents and friends and family to, to rest easy for two years knowing that I was going to one of the safer parts of Mexico. Like the first day of my last transfer, I had just gotten with my last companion and there's a lot of people in Puebla and all over Mexico that have spent time working in the United States. But in Puebla, it's not like, instead of spending a lot of time like in Texas and California and along the border, a lot of them have gone 
farther into the country. And so you hear about them having spent time, they always talk about going to New York and New Jersey. And so one time, so this last transfer we met, this my companion and I met this man named Omar. And Omar was, he had spent some time in the United States and he came back. And while he was in the United States, I think he had, be, he had met the missionaries and become baptized. And so he saw us and he was talking to us about how he had come home from his mission, but he he'd come home from the state, I should mean, and he was, um, but he had a hard time trying to keep on going to church because he can't, because he had to work more to continue making, making money and it was tough because I don't think he had a lot of family that was in the gospel, but he was talking to us and he says, toward the end of this conversation, he was coming back from working in the cornfields, there's lots of cornfields there, and he, he was carrying a backpack and he tells us in Spanish, like, hey elders, I have a squirrel. And we were like, oh, that's, that's good. Like we just kind of turned to look at each other and kind of smile and we're like, okay, we're gonna head out. No, really, I have a squirrel. And then he opened up his backpack, pulls out a dead squirrel, and he'd shot it with a slingshot that day in the fields. And by this time, Elder Gonzalez and I were unable to look at each other because we didn't want to offend this inactive brother. And so we were like, okay, you have a squirrel. That's highly unexpected, but good job. And he, he looks at us and he just like, it's para lunch. It's for lunch. Yeah, baby. And we just, at that moment, we were just like, all right, hermano, good to see you. Nos vemos. We'll see you later. We just walked off, and after about 30 seconds of speed walking away, getting out of sight and out of hearing range, we lost it for about 30 seconds. We just couldn't, couldn't control the laughter anymore, and We've seen, and we saw him on and off since then. And about a couple weeks after I came home with General Conference, and apparently Omar made it to General Conference, and he was coming back to church. He was in one of the he was in the ward we had at the time. But the the squirrel story was probably one of my one of my personal favorites. A lot of people in in Mexico have you'll find names from all around the all around the world, like along with, you know, what you think of as Spanish, like, you know, your stereotypical Spanish names like Pedro or Jose, you also find some names that are in Nahuatl, like Sochi is a common name for girl, for, for a girl, and it mean, it's the Aztec word for flower. Sometimes you also find people that at least their nicknames are English names, and so if a person is named Pedro, their friends might, might call them Peter with a more Spanish accent, and that's something they do all the time. But then there was this one family I met in one of my areas, and they had their, they had named their children with Arabic names. And so they had, the names were a little, I can't think of the names off the top of my head, but they were Arabic names. It was like Harib and his sister's name, I don't remember. And so we met these people, and they'd been listening to the missionaries for years, at least the parents had. And so when I got there, they had been listening to him for a while. They hadn't really gotten baptized, but they knew about the Book of Mormon. They'd read it. They'd been to church a few times. They knew some of the members in their neighborhood. But one of their, they had a son named Harib who was about my age. He was in his like early 20s, I think, when we met him. And he hadn't really listened to the missionaries for a while. But he... Uh, but he started listening right around the time that I arrived. And he, uh, even though he had been the one that was li had been listening to the missionaries for the least amount of time, he was also, the he, when I was there, he, he seemed to be the most excited about the message. And so we would ask, you know, we would, we would go there and ask him to read the scriptures and the, read a chapter out of the Book of Mormon, like missionaries always do. And he would say either, and when we'd come back the next time, you know, he would let us know if he had read it. And if not, then he would, he was more than willing to read with us right then and there and go over the, the top, go over that, at the reading with us. And 
it was really cool because he had because yeah it was this it was this thing that he just really wanted to learn and even when he would fall back into troubles like i think he'd had some trouble with trying to like stop smoking or stop doing drugs but even then like he was still trying to keep in touch with us through his parents and he he was just it was cool to see the turnaround in his life because but he he had he, by the time i left he hadn't been able to be baptized because he was trying to recover from these addictions he had but being able to see these changes in his life were was was really cool and it just i mean it helped me to see kind of the how the gospel helps us and how we can how it really can change our lives and help us to motivate us little by little to make improvements and do what we need to do to do better and go back and to live with our Heavenly Father. It was a really cool experience. Well, the, the Pueblo Mission is, it's a great time. Like, one of the big things that would have helped me when I first got my, my mission call and spent some time in the MTC was just remember that, like, every mission has, is different. Like, some, like, I, like, even though I give you all sorts of advice about what happened to me when I was in Puebla, it'll be different for you than it would be even for one of your companions. Like each one of us has different things that happens to happens to us and they're all they're all there to, to help us and to, the the experiences are, are different so that we can all learn for ourselves what we need to what we need to do and how we how we should do it. Um but Puebla itself yeah it's a it's a good time. I this one of the big things is just don't let other people kind of tell you how how Puebla is. When I when I had first gotten there, people were people were taught were telling all sorts of stories about how Puebla was supposed to be this difficult place, and there were the and how some of the people there were supposedly kind of hard to the gospel, or they were like lifelong Catholics that had no intention of changing, but as I was there I saw that it depended on our faith. And so if you have if you have the faith that Puebla can be a high baptizing mission or that you're gonna find the success that you're looking for, then you can then then you can do it. But just don't let other people influence the way that you look at your mission and the way that you're going to to work there and to do what you need to do. Other than that, it's it's a good yeah it's a it's a good time just be like be helpful to people a lot of times they uh they might not have like, it might be tough sometimes to start off but just by talking to a person on the street but if you show them that you are willing to to do that 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 you actually care about them as individuals and help them to feel this the the worth that that they have like you know every soul is great in the sight of God and so if you help them to see that they are that they have worth to God, then you'll be able to slowly help them to see the the value of the gospel in their lives, and that's the way that you that's the best way to start getting them converted and to help bring them closer to the gospel. And I mean, I can't like it's yeah, it's just it's a good time, and if that's where you've been called to go, then there's a there's a good reason for it, and. Whether or not you realize, and whether or not you can realize it now, God will help you by the end of your mission to realize why it is that you were specifically called to Puebla, and you'll be able to see the the blessings He has in store for you. It's a it's a good time. The people are great. the The food is is great. It's a it's a good it's a good place to go in Mexico because it's it's safe and a lot of great history and places to see when you're on your your P day as well, so just enjoy your enjoy your time in Puebla.